You're the person the world needs. Life is changing, and the future is uncertain. You may not know how or why yet, but you know you're here to make a difference. You're not waiting for the universe to give you the answers. You're finding them for yourself. Challenging echoes with evidence. Few people have great ideas. Even fewer make them happen. It takes a dreamer, an explorer, a researcher, a leader, a thinker. It takes someone like you. My name is Bianca. I'm part of the UNSW Future Students team and tonight we're going to dive into everything about HSC subject selection. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that UNSW is located on the unceded territory of the Bedigal, Gadigal and Ngunnawal peoples. They are the traditional owners of this land where each of the UNSW campuses are located. I also want to extend my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us today. I'm joining you from Bedjigal land, that's where the Kensington campus is located. And if you know where you're located and you feel comfortable, feel free to pop it in our Q&A box. It would be lovely to find out where everyone's joining us from. Okay, HSC subject selection, your journey ahead. Again, a warm welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. I want to also thank the amazing support crew, the parents. There are many things to consider over the next few years. So know that there is plenty of support. Speak to your parents, an older sibling, your careers advisor and universities. Universities are a fantastic resource to find out what it's like to study after high school. So visit us and join our events. Okay, so tonight we're going to cover the nitty gritty information on how HSE marks are calculated, how your ATAR is calculated, what can you expect when you study your HSC courses? How do you actually choose your HSC subjects? That component of the evening will be covered by two UNSW students. They're going to share their insights on how they chose their courses and transitioned into uni. We also have UAC joining us. That reminds me, you're going to start hearing some brand new acronyms and UAC is the first one. UAC is the university's admission centre and they're going to explain their role in your final high school years and the ATAR a little bit later tonight. Whilst all of this is happening, we have our Q&A box on the right of your screen. Feel free to ask us anything. Your questions are private, so just feel like this is a safe place to ask us anything. We have a fantastic team working in the background, feverishly typing away to answer all of your questions. And as we conclude the evening, we'll go into some dropout sessions, or drop-in sessions, sorry. We'll have one for parents and one for students, so they're going to be separate virtual rooms where we'll have live Q&A sessions. We thought we might have different rooms for parents and students because sometimes the questions are a little bit different, but you can join any of them, it's okay. Okay, let's get into your first new information. You're going to hear these acronyms so much over the next couple of years, I thought they deserved their own slide. The first is UAC, the University's Admissions Centre. The second is your ATAR, the Australian Tertiary Admissions Rank. And UAC will describe that a little bit in, in a little bit of time. And then there's the Selection Rank. So the Selection Rank is what universities look at when we consider you for an offer into your dream degree. But don't worry about having to remember all of this. You are at the beginning of your journey. You can take this information away and absorb and ask more questions later. I'm going to hand over to Wendy from UAC and then you'll hear from Nish, our current student, about her journey from year 10 through year 11 and 12 and then transitioning into uni. So I'll hand over to Wendy from UAC now.
Ah, oh, thanks Bianca. So tonight I'm here to talk about the ATAR and subject selection. So uh, what is UAC? It stands for University Admission Centre and you've already heard that. What do we do? Well, we process applications for 28 different institutions within New South Wales and the ACT. We also process three access scheme applications, but you'll learn more about those applications and the schemes when you're in year 11 and year 12. Importantly though, we calculate the ATAR for all New South Wales students. So what is the ATAR? Well, firstly, you're, over the next two years, you're about to work towards completing your first qualification, which is your HSC. And as such, it's a really good idea for you to know the difference between your HSC and your ATAR. They're both measures of achievement, but they'll be reporting to you two different things. At the end of year 12, you'll be able to download your HSC results from the NESA website, and there you'll see all your different course results. There'll be marks out of 100 for your exams and marks out of 100 for your assessments. On the same day, this is at the end of Year 12, you'll be able to jump onto the UAC website and download your ATAR. There'll be one number and it's going to report to you where you positioned against all students in your cohort. So just keep in mind, HSC is all about performance and ATAR is all about position. When we're talking to students about this, we get you to imagine that the HSC is a marathon or a race. So if it was a race, your HSC results would represent your finishing time and your ATAR would represent your finishing place or position. If you're going to enter a race, you'd train every day, you'd work hard to get your fastest time. It's the only thing you can control. You can control your performance, but you can't control where you're going to finish or place in the race. So it's a bit like that with the HSC, but training would be studying hard, improving in all your courses, getting your best results, because it's the only way you can achieve your best possible ATAR. So motto is work hard on your performance. It's the only thing you can control. You can't control where you're going to place. You can't control your ATAR or anybody else's ATAR. Okay, to be eligible for an HSC, in Year 11, you'll be required to do 12 units of courses. That's a NESA requirement. But in Year 12, some students do decide to drop down to 10 units, but seek the advice from your school if you decide you're going to do that. But for an ATAR, we need 10 units of board developed courses, two units of English, eight units of Category A courses, and four subject areas. So what is the ATAR? Well, it stands for Australian Tertiary Admissions Rank, and that's what it is. It's a rank. It's not a score or a mark out of 100. It's all about your overall position. It's a number between 0 and 99.95, and the last point is the most important. The sole purpose of the ATAR is so universities can rank and select students for their courses, particularly their competitive courses. Now, in saying that, some universities will use the ATAR in conjunction with other criteria like a portfolio, an interview, a personal statement and there are some universities that offer early entry schemes where they're using completely different criteria other than the ATAR. Okay, for the ATAR calculation, as I said before, we need 10 units of board developed courses, 2 units of English and then your best 8 remaining units. For the ATAR calculation, we use scaled marks and these marks are not reported to you. Now, the first step that we do is scaling. Now, if every single student in New South Wales did exactly the same courses for the HSC, we wouldn't need to scale because ATAR is all about a rank. So we could compare your results in the same courses and then rank you from highest to lowest. But you don't do all the same courses. Last year, there was more than 25,000 different combinations of courses completed by Year 12 students. So how do we look at all these different course results? with courses that have completely different course content and rank you from highest to lowest. Well, we have to make an adjustment and that's what scaling does. It creates a level playing field so we can compare everyone's results properly and fairly. 
And the reason we have scaling is because we don't want any student to be advantaged or disadvantaged because of their subject choice. Because we want you to be picking courses for year 11 and year 12, things that you're good at, that you have a natural ability and aptitude for, things that you enjoy, and importantly, courses that are going to set you up for success at university. Okay, just a few scaling truths because there is a lot of misinformation about scaling out there. We don't scale courses. We're scaling the academic ability of students within each course. Remember, ATAR is about your position, where you've positioned in all your courses against everyone else. So when you hear about a course that has a high scaled mean or a low scaled mean, it's really telling you about the strength of the competition. So a course that has a high scaled mean, that's because lots of academic students have taken that course. You know, they're quite competitive and that's telling you about the strength in that course. And a course that has a low scaled mean is just reporting to you that there's a variety of academic students that have taken that course. If you choose a course that has a high scaled mean or a low scaled mean, it's not going to automatically lead you to a high or a low ATAR. The point is you can get a high ATAR no matter the courses that you complete or the combination. It's not about the course, it's about how well you position in one course, actually all your courses, against everyone else. Okay, just to explain the relationship between um, the HSC reporting on your performance and the ATAR reporting on your position, it's good for you to have a look at our two students, Fred and Laura, and see their story. We've got Fred and Laura, they studied the same 12 units of courses, and you can see Fred got marks of 70 for all his courses, Laura got marks of 80, only a 10 point difference, but if we have a look at their ATAR or position, there's a 20 point difference. So let's break it down a little, just so you can get an idea of the relationship between HSC being performance and ATAR being position. So if we look at Fred's uh, performance of 70 in biology, that performance placed him in the 37th percentile of students. So it's telling us that 63% of students got a higher mark than 70 in biology last year. Whereas Laura, 10 extra little marks with that performance of 80 has really bolstered her position and ATAR's all about position. And we can see that performance of 80 has placed her in the 72nd percentile. So only 28% of students received a higher mark. Have a look at the median mark was 74. So Fred and Laura, they're placed either side of that median mark. If you're looking at all those median marks and thinking they're quite high, most average or median marks are in the mid 70s to early 80s. That's because the majority of students that go on to complete year 11 and year 12 are quite academic and HSC marks always range between 50 and 100, so it uh, stands to reason that average marks are around the mid-70s to 80s. If we quickly have a look at English Advanced, we can see that poor old Fred with that mark at 70, it placed him in the 7th percentile. So 93% of students uh, got a better mark than Fred for English Advanced last year. And Laura, she's still below the average with her performance of 80, but she's placed better, and that's going to impact her ATAR. So last year, the median ATAR was 70.8. If we have a look at all of Fred's percentiles or placements, with his performance of 70, he's placed in the bottom 50th percent of students. So he is going to be on the lower side of that median ATAR 70.4. Now Laura, most of her percentiles are in the 50th percent and above. So again, this is going to be reflected in her positioning and she is going to be on the higher side of that ATAR. Remember that your ATAR will comprise of 50% assessment mark. Everything that you do in year 12 is reported by your school to NESA. The other 50% is your HSC exam results. They're averaged, they're sent to UAC, and that's what we use in our ATAR our calculations. A couple of things to remember from this example is a few marks can make a big difference, so please work hard. And the other thing to remember is all the work that you do in year 11 and year 12 is actually building up your academic muscle to take on that higher level of study once you enter university. So 
I'm going to talk about subject selection now because you're going to be making some important decisions very soon, I'd imagine, about what courses you'll study in Year 11 and Year 12. So um, we'd like you to start thinking about your goals. So what type of career do you think you might like to have? And investigate what courses are offered by the universities and what ones may interest you. Now there's 117 HSC courses on offer. Obviously they're not going to be all at your school, but think about which ones interest you, uh, maybe which ones you have a natural ability in, and seek the feedback from your teachers to find out which ones that you get your best results in. It's important to uh, check out to see that you're going to be ATAR eligible. And you can do this by checking the ATAR eligibility calculator on the UAC website and also your school will confirm this. Another thing that's really important is to investigate the HSC courses offered at your school and think about which ones are going to be a good foundation for success at university. If you go to a university website and have a look at the course information, the university will tell you which HSC courses that they recommend or assume that you'll be studying in Year 11 and Year 12. So please take their recommendations into consideration when you're deciding on what HSC subjects to choose. And lastly, check to see if there's any course prerequisites. A prerequisite is a must-have. If you haven't completed that course, you won't be eligible for an offer. Not many universities have course prerequisites. Um, however, if they do, it's usually for their more academically challenging courses. Okay, so we have a quick checklist here to make sure that you're ready for subject selection. So firstly, Research future careers, so what you might be interested in, and then research what kind of study you'll need to do to be able to follow your dream career. Uh, number two, consider your abilities and interests. So what courses are you interested in? What do you like? What you're good at? It's a really great idea to take courses that you enjoy because they're the ones you're going to get your best results in. Number three, uh, do some research on what the universities recommend or uh, assume that you've undertaken in year 11 and year 12 because those courses are going to give you good preparation for your first year at university in particular. Um, also check to see if there's any course prerequisites because you don't want something preventing you from being eligible to receive an offer. And finally, be prepared to study hard and enjoy your chosen HSC courses. So what's coming up next for the next two years? This is just a quick timeline. Uh, in year 11, you'll be working away, studying hard, getting great results. It's important to work hard in Year 11. If any of you are thinking about applying for any early entry schemes, the universities do have access to your Year 11 results and they might make their decisions based on that. Now in Year 12, you can apply for university entry and it's usually in April. At the same time, you can apply for the School Recommendation Scheme, which is an early entry scheme, the Educational Access Scheme, if you've had a disadvantage that's impacted your learning in Year 11 and Year 12, and Equity Scholarship Scheme as well. Uh, in November of your Year 12 year, if you've applied for earlier entry, you may receive an offer. But everyone looks forward to December because ATARs are released and the first ATAR base offers are made in December. So in closing, I'd just like you to remember a few important things. Firstly, an ATAR is a rank. It's not a mark. Make sure you choose courses that you like and that you're good at because these are the ones you're going to get your best HSC results in. And don't forget to explore all your options on the university websites and on UAC website. And please take into consideration what the universities recommend or assume that you have studied at HSC level before you make your decisions. So all the best with your subject selection choices. Please reach out to us at UAC. We have many social channels that you can send us a message on or contact our friendly uh, customer service team. We're always happy to help with your subject se selection decisions as well. All the best, thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Nish 
and I'm a fifth year arts law student studying at UNSW. I know most of you are in your 10 and some of you might even be in your 11 and 12 and are nearing the end of your high school experience. You're probably wondering what's after high school and some of you may even be contemplating university. Today I'm here to share my experience from year 10 up until university and hopefully share some tips and tricks with you along the way. So let's take it back to the beginning. To be honest, I didn't think too much about uni while I was in year 10, but it's great that you guys all are. You're giving yourself the time to make a conscious decision about what HSC subjects you want to choose and what degree you eventually want to study. As you choose your subjects for year 11 and 12, you're probably looking into what prerequisite knowledge you require for your dream degree. But fear not, the decision you make in year 10 doesn't dictate the rest of your university studies. At UNSW, we don't have prerequisites, only assumed knowledge. What this means is we look at your overall selection rank for your dream degree and not your marks in individual subjects. However, having the assumed knowledge is really useful and it will help you in your first year and it will make it a little bit easier. Especially if you already know what degree you want to do, we encourage you to do those assumed knowledge subjects for your HSC. But don't stress if you don't have the assumed knowledge because at UNSW, we have heaps of bridging courses on offer to get you back up to speed. We encourage you to take the time in year 10 to figure out what interests you and what you eventually want to carry through into university. For example, I really loved history, which is why I chose modern history as my HSC subject. And I did really well in it, which allowed me to get a high selection rank. Because I really enjoyed it so much in high school, it allowed me to choose it as my major for my arts degree. And if you don't know what you want to study in university, don't worry at all, that's completely fine. We encourage you to come to our year 10 experience days where we have fun workshops and small talks in all our different subject areas for you to discover what you're interested in. So now we're in year 11 where you've just chosen your HSC subject. But it doesn't stop there and there's heaps you can be doing during this time to improve your uni application. For the next two years, it's important that you focus not only just on your academic studies, but also building your extracurriculars and your experiences outside of high school. Unis don't only just look at your academic merit, they're also interested to see how well-rounded you are. We want to know who you are, what your hobbies, passions and interests are. Especially here at UNSW, you're not just doing a degree. A big part of our uni is being involved in student life. For example, when I was in high school, I was a prefect, leading the school social justice club, playing netball and dancing. I was also able to carry these through into university by joining arts dance classes and volunteer programs. This is also a good time to be looking into scholarship, and if you're looking to move away from home, then accommodation on campus. And now we're in year 12, where you've just heard back from our friends at UF, and you're looking to put in your university preferences. Honestly, this can be quite a stressful time, but a key piece of advice that I would give myself is to not put too much pressure on yourself into getting into your dream degree. Here at UNSW, we have heaps of options to boost your options to getting into, uni to getting into your dream degree. This can include extra admission schemes, adjustment factors, which are points that are added onto your ATAR for the HSC subjects that you choose and for your extracurriculars. And once you're here, we also have internal program transfer, which means if you don't like the degree that you chose in your first year, you can move to a different degree in your second year. This is also a good time to come check, out, check us out at UNSW Open Day. You don't have to be in year 12 to join, and we encourage you to come as early as possible to see what UNSW has to offer. Now you've made it into uni. I know uni can seem like a scary, unknown place, but I want to share some exciting aspects of uni life that you can look forward to. Firstly, you don't have classes nine to three every day, which means you get to choose a timetable that works around you. This gives you the flexibility to work part-time, make friends, and even if you're like me, sneak a bit of a sleep in. Another, another thing is at UNSW, at UNSW, we have heaps of opportunities and societies for you to get involved in. From food lover society, to debating society, to even K-pop society, there's something for everyone. This is a good way to explore current interests, create new ones, and make lifelong friends. 
We also have extremely lovely teaching and support staff who are more than happy to help if you have any questions. Finally, uni is a great way to gain some independence and learn more about yourself. Thanks so much for joining me on our speedy trip from year 10 to uni. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to our future student advisors. We hope you enjoyed the information session and we can't wait to see you on campus soon at our year 10 experience days and open day. Thanks, Nish. It's wonderful to hear straight from students about how they approach the same process you're about to go through. Now let's talk about HSC subject selection. I'm going to give you a little bit of information and expand around what Wendy said, and also look at this through the lens of UNSW entry. So I'm going to actually start there because my first point, I hope, immediately relieves any kind of stress you're feeling. The first thing I want to tell you is that we don't have any prerequisites. We have something called assumed knowledge. So assumed knowledge is where we will start teaching you at a certain level, just assuming that you have already reached that level. So the Bachelor of Commerce has assumed knowledge of advanced maths. If you don't have the assumed knowledge, it's okay. The assumed knowledge is not compulsory. So that means you won't be excluded from receiving an offer into your dream degree if you don't have the assumed knowledge. You can still apply for it. The even better news is, if you are feeling worried, I don't have the assumed knowledge for my dream degree, it's okay. We have plenty of support and lots of bridging courses you can take. You can get some tutoring and I'm sure you're going to make friends with some really wonderful people and form great study groups. So that's the first point. Just know that we have assumed knowledge and we don't have prerequisites. Okay. Let's have a look at what how the HSE is structured. So all courses have a unit value. Most courses have two units, so that's modern history or English, for example, and that's approximately 120 hours of study, and you'll get a mark out of 100. Some courses are one unit, and they equate to about 60 hours of study and a mark out of 50. They are usually extension courses, so extension English, extension maths. Why do they have a unit value? It's because you need to study a minimum of 12 units in year 11 and 10 units in year 12. All right, let's have a quick look at the HSC requirements. And I'm just going to check whether my slides are actually working. I made some really pretty ones for everyone. So I'm just going to click this arrow and see whether that's working. Here we go. Okay, so HSC requirements. So you can't just choose any HSC course. There are a couple of requirements. So you have to make sure you have at least four subjects covered. That sounds a little funny because four subjects doesn't really seem like a lot, but I'll explain it using an example. So let's say you enroll in advanced English, that's two units, then add extension one English, that's one unit, and then extension two English, that's another unit. So you have a total of four units there, but you've covered one subject. So that's what we mean by subjects, it's subject areas. The second thing you need to think about when you're choosing your HSC subjects is at least three courses need to be two units or greater. You also have to stick with English, so you've got to have two units of English in year 11 and year 12. For those of you that absolutely love science, just bear in mind that you can only have a maximum of six units in science for year 11 and a maximum of seven units in science in year 12. And overall, the last point there is at least six units need to be board developed courses and we'll go into those now. Okay, so board developed courses, they're developed by NESA. So that's another little interesting acronym you're going to come across. You won't hear, uh, hear it very often, but they are the New South Wales Education Standard and they have board developed courses. So board developed courses are where, let's say you enroll in a board developed course and your friend enrolls in the same board developed course, but you're at different schools. 
you're going to be studying the same curriculum and you're going to sit the same exam. So it's uniform across the whole state. Board developed courses also include uh, life skill courses, but just bear in mind, they can't contribute to the calculation of your ATAR. We also have board endorsed courses. So that's where the syllabus has been endorsed by NESA and they cater for other areas that board developed courses might not necessarily study and they might offer you some alternative career paths. Let's have a look at board developed courses and the ATAR. So you've got your category A courses. So they're the ones that have that real academic rigor behind it, like biology or geography, and they can be used in con to contribute to your ATAR. We also have category, category B courses. So they can cover other areas like hospitality or human services, but just bear in mind that no more than two units of category B courses can be used towards your ATAR. So how do your HSC marks actually work? How are they calculated? You'll go through all of these courses, you'll choose them, you'll study them, but how do your marks work? So you've got two components. The first is an internal assessment. So your internal assessment is everything that you do in your year 12 year, all of your assignments, all of your written exams, all of the things that you are marked on at school, that forms your internal assessment. It is a requirement that 50% of your reported HSC mark is based on internal assessment. It's also really important to have it there because some of you, hopefully not, but some of you might find yourselves in an extenuating circumstance where you're not able to sit your HSC exam. In that case, you might be able to apply for an appeal. And if your appeal is successful, then 100% of your HSC mark will be based on the, the internal assessment. The second component is the external exam. So your external exam are your written exams, but just bear in mind, if you choose a course like music or visual arts, they also have practical components and that will also form part of the external exam. The satisfactory completion of a course. I feel like this goes without saying, but I'll mention it anyway. You have to follow the course developed or endorsed by NESA. Apply yourself, be diligent, have a study plan, reach out to your careers advisors, talk to your parents, set goals, enjoy the experiences your school gives you that helps you with your study. And also those of you doing VET courses, they might have an external placement. So you have to successfully complete that to get through the course. A very quick one on the literacy and numeracy standards. So since 2020, students need to um, demonstrate the minimum standard in literacy and numeracy. There are three tests, reading, numeracy and writing. And if you want a little bit more information and, and, and lots more resources, you can jump on the NESA website. There's plenty there for students, parents and schools to have a look at. This one, so this one is really important. I mean, all of the information is important, but this one is key. So when you go into year 11 and 12 and university, you're going to be doing assignments that you probably have never done before. They're going to be a bit of a different level. And so one thing that we like to include there is around referencing or crediting an author for their ideas. So I'll use an example so that you can understand very clearly. So you're writing an assignment, you're trying to formulate all of your ideas, you're reading all of these fantastic sources on the websites, reading articles, and you're thinking to yourself, these ideas are great, this is exactly what I want to say, it's helping me formulate all of my ideas. You write your assessment and you hand it in, but you didn't once mention that some of these ideas weren't your own. They helped you form your argument. And that's called plagiarism. When you, when you don't reference the author, that's called plagiarism. And so what the HSC All My Own Work program is about is it teaches you how to properly credit an author throughout your writing. Before I wrap up this segment of the event and I introduce Mitch, our current student, who will dive into his key considerations and his strategy around choosing his HSC courses, I'm going to give you a few of my own points. Abilities, 
expanding on Wendy's fantastic advice around abilities and motivation. If you're good at something, then you're gonna do well and that's going to help your mark and it will help your ATAR. Think about what really interests you and motivates you. If you're interested in a subject, you're more likely to just dive into the material, do all of your study, spend hours looking at it and do really well. The third point, I contemplated whether I would put the third point in because you are in year 10 and nobody expects you to know what you wanna be when you grow up. This is not about creating the five year or the 10 year plan on a spreadsheet. But if you have any ideas about what your career aspirations are, it's a good idea to make sure that your year 11 and 12 study might line up with that and line up with a potential degree that you'll study at university that will move into that career area. If you don't really know what your career aspirations are, that's okay, don't worry. Talk to your careers advisor or your parents or your friends. Other people can lend different perspectives on what you're really good at and what you're suited to. Lastly, be practical. Think about the practical components of your HSC subjects and whether you have other commitments in life. Do you have part-time work? Are you part of a sporting team? Just have a look at what your schedule is like outside of study so that you can balance everything. And finally, we have the HSC credential, your record of school achievement. So this is for students who are eligible to receive it and they leave school before they complete their higher school certificate. So they can still access their record of school achievement and have a record of all of the marks that they accumulated throughout year 12. That's it from me about subject selection. I'm going to hand over to Mitch, who is a current student studying a double degree in science and commerce, and Cody, who's part of the future students team. And they're going to have a chat and a real deep dive into how Mitch chose his subjects, what were his strategies, what were his key considerations, and how he transitioned into university. So thanks, Mitch and Cody. Hi and welcome to UNSW. I'm Cody from the Future Students team and today joining me we have Mitch Fay, who's a current student of ours. So earlier we had Nish take us through a speedy journey of what the next few years are going to look like and her journey into um, university. So along the journey she talked about some choices she had to make and the decision making process that kind of went behind that. And with Mitch today, we're going to take a deep dive into that decision-making process and how to navigate the next few years. So thanks for joining us, Mitch. Thanks for having me. So let's get started. Mitch, can you tell us about what you're studying and how far along you are? Yep. Uh, so I am a second-year student. I'm studying Commerce um, and Advanced Science Honours. My major for Commerce is International Business. My major for Advanced Science is Psychology. Wow, that's awesome. Really setting yourself up for some great options there. So I guess let's take it back. Let's take it back to year 10. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what your decision making process was like looking at subjects and, and how, to, how to navigate that? Yeah, for sure. So um, in year 11, um, I studied um, extension English 1, uh, advanced um, maths, engineering, French, and business and economics. Um, and then in year 12, I picked up extension to English and then dropped uh, engineering and French. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through a bit of a process that I had uh, throughout those uh, two years. Uh, so then um, I was able to you know, make a really good and informed decision. So first thing I did was that um, I studied what I was passionate about. So I was really passionate about uh, you know, business and the economy. Um, and I knew that you know, I potentially may want to do that at university. Mm. So um, I really looked at you know, uh, doing business studies and economics. Um, because I knew that you know, there's, those are where my interests lie. Um, the benefit of doing that is that you're able to maximize your marks because you're actually really interested in the work that you're doing and you're driven to uh, do well in those subjects. Um, and by doing that, you're then able to maximize your selection rank for university. So um, the next thing that I did was I identified the strengths that I had. So some students, uh, their strengths lie in creativity. So they might consider doing uh, visual arts or dance. Uh, other students are more mathematically orientated, so they might consider doing, uh, you know, 
math heavy subjects like engineering uh, or extension maths. And then other students are more um, orientated in the humanities so that they might consider the HSA subjects uh, or extension English. So for me, um, I was very um, humanities orientated. So um, my year 12 subjects um, were, you know, English um, and then HSA subjects with one math subject. So um, by identifying your strengths, um, it kind of plays into your interests as well. So um, it helps to, you know, maximize your selection rank as well there. Um, the third thing I did was, uh, and this is um, looking at um, selecting subjects more strategically. So I checked the assumed knowledge uh, for UNSW. Uh, for the commerce and the advanced science honors, which was the uh, degree that I was interested in. So um, the assumed knowledge there is advanced maths. Uh, and so that was my rationale behind uh, picking advanced maths, um, even though I was maybe perhaps more orientated in the humanities. Um, so um, it's really important that you, know, you uh, understand what um, assumed knowledge um, is required of you. Um, so then you're able to best prepare yourself for the degree you're interested in. If uh, you find yourself uh, studying uh, courses that don't align with a particular degree in the future, um, so let's say you did standard maths and you're interested in a degree that uh, has advanced maths, uh, you are able to take bridging courses um, and get a lot of support here as well uh, once you actually come to university. Um, and the last thing that I did was I really contextualized um, how my studies would fit in with the rest of my life. So I looked at uh, what I was doing uh, in my life at the time, um, as well as studies. And that's really important to do because you don't want to burn out. So I remember when I first burnt out, it was uh, May in 2019. Um, and it's not a great feeling to have. And it can really throw you around um, and can really uh, hinder your studies. So it's important to know, you know, what it is that you're also doing in your life. So are you working? Are you playing sport? Uh, for me, I was in the wind orchestra uh, from year seven all the way to year 12. Um, and I was also in the SRC up until year 11, and I was a prefect in year 12. So I had to really work my studies um, in with the other things that I was doing. I was also working part-time. Um, and that also goes for major works as well, so understanding and knowing which subjects in year 12 have major works. Um, so um, extension to English, visual arts, um, and society and culture, for instance. Uh, some I had some friends that did all three subjects, um, and. Uh, you know, having three major works is um, quite uh, stressful at times. So just being able to manage that uh, in with uh, everything else that you're doing is really important to do. Definitely. I can remember my major work being due for art and, and having a similar, similar breakdown <laughs> moment. So um, I don't know how doing three would be, but, mm. you know, you do you. Um, so I guess there's a lot to consider. So... Are there any particular people that you know students can talk to um, to really navigate that that process? Yeah, for sure. Students can definitely talk to uh, their careers advisor, mm -hmm. um, their teachers, and you know any family members and anyone else that they trust. So, going to a careers advisors and teachers are really important uh, because uh, the teachers are the ones that you know kind of know mm -hmm. what the study load will look like for each subject, um, and the careers advisors will be able to um, advise them on you know which subjects may be best to pick uh, depending on what they're interested in the future. So I spent a lot of time talking to my careers advisor uh, and the head of welfare at my school yeah. um, to just kind of understand what my options were in the future, um, but also to just get some advice on some study tips um, and just some you know, general well-being um, throughout year 11 and 12. Yeah, they're, they're definitely a wealth of knowledge um, for you to, to talk to and, um, and really bounce some, to some ideas off. So. Looking forward, um, why are you NSW? Why why are you here with us? Well, um, I guess I just I fell in love with you know the community and the opportunities uh, that were on offer here. So, um, firstly, um, in terms of the academic side, um, I had a lot of flexibility around uh, the degree that I wanted to do um, and how the actual structure would look like. So, because of the three plus structure that we have here, I was able to fit in uh, a lot of part time work. Um, and not be too stressed with uni at the same time, uh, which has been really, really beneficial for me, um, as I'm someone who likes to, you know, kind of balance a bit of everything in life. Um, and I guess as well, the clubs and societies that we have on offer here has been, you know, a really great experience, and having that student life aspect as well as your academics has been really important for me. So 
Uh, I remember in my first year, I, I got involved with the QSOC Society. Uh, so I got to go uh, play pool um, in the city oh. and out at Burwood, which That's was really fun. Yeah, I got to play in a first year's competition, which was very exciting. I unfortunately lost in the first round, but uh, it was a good experience nonetheless. Um, and uh, this year I've kind of focused more on uh, the UNSW Esports Society. Uh, so they run a casual league uh, for different games uh, every term. So I've entered in that um, for uh, two terms now uh, with some, uh, some friends, uh, which has been really exciting. They uh, actually streamed one of uh, our matches on Twitch, which was really cool. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's just you know great to be part of that community, but also have you know the flexibility um, of being able to you know study in a way that suits me best. Yeah, that sounds so exciting, and it's so important to have that balance when you're studying um, at university and and even through the HSC. So let's come back to that framework. How how do we evaluate options um, when choosing which university that we're going to pick? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I've got four recommendations that uh, students uh, consider uh, when they're evaluating the options. So the first thing is to really identify what matters to them. So, you know, just take five minutes just to jot down uh, some notes on, you know, why you want to go to university and what you want to get out of it. Um, and then this will help them uh, kind of make a really informed decision uh, in terms of, you know, which university they're interested in. So they'll be able to look for these uh, when they, you know, go to open days um, and stuff like that. So uh, for me, uh, the things that really mattered were high quality teaching standards um, and flexibility to be able to fit in uh, other things in my personal life. Um, so I had those uh, in the back of my mind when I was evaluating my options. Um, and yeah, found it really beneficial uh, to, you know, consider those things. Um, I think the next thing that students should really consider doing is experiencing uni uh, before they actually come to uni. So uh, we have year 10 experience days on offer uh, for year 10 students to kind of see what it's like to be a student at uh, UNSW. Um, and we've also got um, open day as well, uh, which is available uh, for all students, 10 to 12, um, where they can actually come and see what it's like to study uh, on campus and to see all of the amazing opportunities that we have on offer. Um, I think the, the third thing that students uh, really should do is kind of the same thing uh, for their year 11 and 12 subjects is to really study what you're passionate about. So you're gonna get a lot more out of your degree if you're doing something that you really enjoy um, and that you're doing something that you, know, you can see yourself doing in the future. So studying something uh, that you're passionate about is super important. Um, and if you find yourself doing something that you're not really interested in at first, don't be afraid to change. Um, you know, that's also a really important thing to keep in mind. Uh, for me, uh, you know, I was really interested in uh, business uh, in year 11 and 12, and then uh, kind of towards the end of year 12, I was really interested in psychology. Uh, and so um, I was really excited to, you know, bridge the two together uh, in my double degree um, to be able to, um, yeah, study, you know, exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and I think the fourth thing that students should do is to, uh, yeah, talk to their careers advisors uh, and teachers especially. Uh, so careers advisors have the working knowledge uh, of, you know, all universities uh, and they'll be able to guide the students uh, with their options uh, in terms of, you know, what they should do. And the teachers can provide them with their own experiences. Uh, I had a couple of teachers that uh, did that uh, for myself uh, and for some of my friends uh, in year 12. Uh, and so that's really invaluable information because, um, you know, it's information that us as students, you know, don't have yet. Um, and so being able to have that advice can really help make an informed decision. Definitely. We have so many great fun opportunities for students to get involved in before they start university. Um, but let's take, take us through some quick fire questions. So mm -hmm. I've got five of them for you. Yep. Just two words. Some of them might need a few more, but mm -hmm. let's fire away. So mm -hmm. what's the, your favorite thing about your degree? Um, it'd have to be the integrated first year in the uh, commerce degree. Awesome. Your favorite spot on campus? Definitely the library lawn. Yep. Love that. And coffee, where's your go-to? Definitely Plume, uh, next to the business school, amazing coffee. Awesome. What about extracurricular activities? Uh, at the moment, it would have to be UNSW Esports. And what are the, the most exciting things you're looking forward to in the next few years of your degree? Uh, that would have to be probably the student exchange opportunities that are on offer. Awesome. We have over 300 um, exchange partners globally, so that will be awesome for you to be able to choose, mm. choose there. So, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thanks so much, Mitch, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. 
we um, hope to see you on campus at UNSW soon and good luck with all of your choices. Thanks so much, Cody and Mitch. It is so good to hear insights from a student who just went through the same process. We're just about to hop into our Q&A session, so the parents' Q&A session and the students' Q&A session. But before I wrap up, I just wanna let you know about our upcoming events. So I've been talking all about how universities are a fantastic resource. Well, now is your chance to come and visit us at our year 10 experience days on campus. So that is going to be run by our student ambassadors. You're going to do many wonderful workshops. You might delve into something scientific or engineering or super creative or something to do with the faculty of law. So come along on campus, register for our experience days. The links aren't quite live yet, but we will be sending them out to uh, the parents in the parents newsletter and to our careers advisors in the educators newsletter. So watch that space. And of course, Open Day. Open Day is our most, our most beloved event, our most major event of the year. It's where the entire university will be activated. And it's just come one, come all. Come and see the campus, come and visit us on Saturday, the 3rd of September at Open Day. And we'll be sending the registration links through the newsletter and it will be alive on our website a little bit further down the track. If you are still curious after this event and before you come and visit us on campus, you can always contact our future students team if you have any questions about UNSW. They are like the UNSW encyclopedias, our wonderful um, student advisors, so feel free to give them a call, write them an email or live text online with them. Okay, so we're going to move into our live Q&A time. So we're going to do that until 7.15. And so we've got a parent's room and we've got a student's room. What we'll do is we'll pop the links into the announcement box and you just simply click on the link and then you are, will arrive in the live Q&A room. I just want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It has been so wonderful to just go through the HSC subject selection, have students give you their own insights, and it's been great to see the questions coming through. So thank you again for joining us, and I'll see you in a moment in the Q&A room. You, you're the person the world needs. Life is changing, and the future is uncertain. You may not know how or why yet, but you know you're here to make a difference. You're not waiting for the universe to give you the answers. You're finding them for yourself. Challenging echoes with evidence. Few people have great ideas. Even fewer make them happen. It takes a dreamer, an explorer, a researcher, a leader, a thinker. It takes someone like you. Our students Q&A section. We just heard um, from Wendy a little bit earlier. She's from UAC and here to answer your questions. And we also heard from me a little bit earlier um, in our Q&A with Mitch. So I've just got some questions that you've been filing through here. Um, Wendy, can we go through a little bit more about the units? And what does units mean? What, what are subjects? Um, and how many do we have to take for year 11 and 12? Okay, well firstly, units are the, the measure that the HSC courses are in. Uh, most courses are in two units, but there are some extension courses that are single units. Um, for the HSC, part of the NESA requirement is that you do 12 units of study. Um, you can speak to your school about that. You will have to sign off on that requirement, so don't worry. Uh, your school is there to guide you to make sure you're doing enough units to be awarded your HSC. Um, but for the ATAR, we only need 10 units of ATAR eligible courses. If you're a student that does more, maybe you're doing extension courses, we will look at all those units for the calculation and use your best scaled marks from the units. Mm. 
I remember I did extension English and that saved me a little bit from my um, poor maths results. So <laughs> that was a good little tip. Um, OK, another question. Um, we had a, a little bit of a curly one come in on the American system. So um, some of the APs are taken in ninth grade. Will they count um, and do their exams have uh, recency limit limitations? OK, if you're doing an overseas qualification and this is just another overseas qualification for UAC to assess it, we will need to see proof of your high school depletion, uh, completion. So you get that in year 12 once you graduate. Um, you'll also have to ask the US College Board to provide UAC electronically your AP results or your SAT results. And then what happens, we will give it an ATAR rank equivalent. So you don't get an ATAR, you get an equivalent rank, and that's what the universities will look at as a basis of entry. Um, the way to find out about your ATAR rank equivalent based on SAT or Sorry, AP this results, just you'd have to actually contact the UAC so Customer Service team to inquire about a schedule. So nearly there. So that's how it works. Great. So basically, UAC does it all for you. Yes, right, <laughs> you do. We try to. Fantastic. OK, I might answer this on, one and on. then I'll um, throw over to Wendy to answer it as well. Yep. How can we avoid getting burnout? So All Mitch right, touched on it a little bit during my Q&A with him earlier, um, but my top tips would be continue all of your extracurricular activities. Make sure that you're really enjoying your time through school. Um, you know, older people will tell you it's, you know, the best time of your life. And um, and I, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, maybe university is, was a little bit better, but... <laughs> <laughs> but school was definitely loads of fun. And I think making sure that you, you're you still, you know, doing your sport, doing your music, you know, doing your debating um, and all of those things right throughout your studies um, will really make sure that you're getting a good sort of work-life balance. Yeah, 100%. That's fantastic advice. Keep up with your sport. Make a timetable. Make time for having an academic, like a break off your academic courses and get out there and have a bit of fun and you'll feel refreshed to come back and, you know, tackle the next, you know, exam or assessment challenge. But great advice. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... I might answer this one about the degree. How much does a major affect the degree? So that was the question, but let me decipher it a little bit. So under your degree, so say we're doing a Bachelor of Science, you pick majors within that. So they're your areas of speciality. So you might be doing a major in psychology or biology or physics. And that's your specialization within your degree. So it doesn't affect the degree, but it's just how you shape those kind of generalist degrees. So you'll be coming out with a Bachelor of Science majoring in psychology or um, any number of those, those topics. So I might throw the next one to Wendy. What about places such as Queensland and other territories? They don't have UAC. What, what systems are they on? Does that put in a, them at a disadvantage to applying for New South Wales institutions? Oh no, um, interstate students, they just need to apply for New South Wales universities via UAC. Uh, we will obtain their ATAR within the application and um, universities know that interstate students will be applying. Most offers for internet students will come out in that January off around, but no interstate student is at a disadvantage whatsoever. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'd love to have you, so yes. <laughs> make sure you apply. Um, what other questions do we have in here? Um, OK, I might answer this one. So do you do bridging courses while you're doing your degree or before? So there's a couple of options here. You can do it um, in the summer before you start. So there are a couple of options um, to do those in the summer school program. Um, or you can do it concurrently. So you can do it at the same time as your first term studies. Um, so I'm part of the Faculty of Medicine. And for those courses, if students haven't done chemistry, there is the option for them to take chemistry whilst they're doing their first um, term of med medical studies. Um, so again, just reiterating that we don't have prerequisites. 
but that means that the assumed knowledge, our lecturers will assume that you already have that level of knowledge. So it may be that if you are struggling, you can pick up those bridging courses whilst you are studying. So there's always that option um, and we're all here to support you throughout that. So next question. Um, I'll I'll throw you the the all <laughs> the all important how does scaling work? I know we talked um, about it earlier, but yeah. did you want to give us another recap just in case? Okay, you shouldn't really be focused on scaling, but we use scaling so we can compare everyone's different results with different course content properly and fairly. So when we're scaling, we're looking at where you positioned in not just one course, but all your courses against everyone else and where they position in all their courses as well. So scaling is really a tool that just allows us to position you all with a, using your results on a level playing field. And when I'm talking to students about this, I get you to think about currency. So we all know that we don't straight out compare currencies in the world. We know a US dollar and Australian dollar they don't have equal value. Well, it's like that with your courses. Um, you might get a 90 in one course, a 90 in another, but the 90s have different meaning because the course content mm. is so different. So with currencies, the tool is exchange rates. And when you know we're looking at you know comparing all your different courses with different course content, the scaling tool is what we use so we can do it properly and fairly. So really, you shouldn't be focused on scaling. Focus on getting your best possible marks, getting marks above the average. To receive an above average ATAR, you need to be getting above average HSC marks in all your courses. Awesome. I never thought about the, the currency as a, as a way to think about it. Yeah. So really, really good example. Um, and I guess that kind of leads on to the next question. Are there, what are some tips on getting a good ATAR? Okay, well, firstly, make sure you choose courses that you enjoy. Um, maybe you have a natural ability, aptitude for. If you enjoy it, you'll do well. And especially you've got to do two years of the course, so you want to be enjoying it. Also, um, check to see what the universities recommend and assume you study, because those things are going to help you in your first year. Because if it's assumed knowledge, the universities are going to start teaching with that in mind. They'll assume that you've got a certain level of basic understanding. So um, yeah, choose courses not based on perceived advantage or disadvantage with scaling, but choose things that you're going to enjoy over the next two years. Absolutely. And I find if you enjoy the subject, you want to put more time into it. And so you won't studying won't feel like a chore as such if you're really enjoying the content that you're studying. Oh, absolutely. And all the research shows that mm -hmm. if you're enjoying it, you will get better results. Absolutely. Um, we are nearly at the end of the question. So if you guys have some more questions for us, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, we are getting through them really quickly. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to pop them in there and they will get fed through fed through to us. Well, um, maybe I'll ask a question that I get at UAC a lot. Students get confused about major and minors. Mm. So do you just want to clarify that a little bit, especially when they go to choose their courses? They want to understand what that means. For sure. Yeah. So if we're looking at a course, say the Bachelor, we'll use science again, the Bachelor of Science, um, you can do two majors or a major and a minor. So the difference between a major and a minor, if we're looking at um, major being big and minor being small, it's the number of courses that you're doing in those um, specialisations. Um, in order to get your degree. So say you're doing a major in physics and that would be 10 courses across your three years and then your minor in biology, that might be four courses or six courses, depending on how many courses you have to play with. Oh, that's really helpful because we do get that question a lot. Another question we get, we get students that are worried that they're not going to get an ATAR high enough to get into a course. Mm. And we always say your ATAR won't define your future success at university. But can you explain, you know, how a student, you know, that may have got a lower selection rank and they didn't get into their dream course, what could mm. they do? Could they apply for a course with a lower selection rank? Are they able to transfer yeah. in second year? 
Absolutely. So there are always pathways. So if you don't get quite the ATAR for your dream course, then apply to the institution that you want to go to. So, for example, if your dream course is um, the Bachelor of Advanced Science and you don't quite get the ATAR, you can apply for a Bachelor of Science or maybe a Bachelor of Arts or something um, with a slightly lower mm -hmm. selection rank. And then in your second year, sorry, at the end of your first year, you can apply for what's called internal program transfer. And so that means using your marks of your university subjects, you can transfer into that degree. So it is a really, really common um, pathway for students. And it may not even be that you've not gotten the ATAR. It might be that you've decided that actually I do want to do science now. And you can change your mind and change your courses, you know, as you go along. So you might do a year of this and a year of that and finally work out what it is you want to do with the rest of your life. Um, so don't be disheartened by by not getting into your, your dream degree. I know I didn't get into my dream degree and mm -hmm. in fact it made it um, even more of a better experience because I was able to do a more generalist degree and get more experience in all different areas and work out that you know, something else was my dream career and here I am. That's fantastic. Look, I think sometimes you have to start university to discover something that you may have a passion for. Another question we get is, can students apply for credits for the courses that they've done in their first year when they do transfer? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So we have at UNSW what's called general education courses. And so they're courses outside of your home degree and home faculty. So if you're doing science, then all of those courses are within your faculty, but you might wanna do courses in commerce or in um, art and design. So you can do those courses as general education and say you've come from one of those degrees, then you can get credit for all those courses that you've already done to contribute to your new degree. Wow, it sounds like you have a lot of options mm. available. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, they're my questions. <laughs> Great. Oh, we've got a couple of a couple more questions oh, here. Amazing. Okay, I'm currently interested in many subjects, but not sure which one to choose. Oh, okay. Well, it sounds like you may be one of these brilliant students that are quite good at everything. Um, think about what you might like to do for a career. Jump on the university websites, check to see what they assume or recommend you study in the HSC for the course, maybe the degree that you're interested in. Um, speak to your teachers, find out the one, the courses that you get your best results in mm -hmm. and um, yeah, make a decision from there. But it sounds like you're a bit of an all rounder and you love everything, which is fantastic. You're lucky in that in that sense, actually. <laughs> yeah, having more choices is not always a bad no. thing. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. So this question says, I'm wondering if the school you attend and their HSC rank affects your rank of ATAR and if your placement on school matter, whether you come first in a subject at your school, does that affect the ATAR? Okay, well, firstly, the school you attend doesn't impact the ATAR at all. We don't know it. We don't include it in any of the calculation. Um, your rank in a particular subject and your assessment mark is given to NESA by your school. NESA looks at all the different ranks for that particular subject and your assessment marks for your school and they use that to do a thing called moderation. And moderation is used by NESA to take out the differences between schools. Schools get uh, results pretty accurate, but they moderate because some schools may mark harder than others. So that's why they're taking out the difference between schools. And it's really important to get your best marks and it's great if you're ranked high in your class, but remember, ATAR is not just looking at, you know, you in your class at school. It's yeah. looking at you in the whole state. You might be average in a particular class at your school, mm -hmm. but you may be up near the top in the state because ATAR is about a rank for everyone in your cohort. Perfect. I think that answered it. Um, I might take the next one. How long are lectures or classes at uni? How many hours would you be spending in class per week? So this is all very dependent on what you're studying. So it varies between subjects. So some might have more what we call contact hours, which means where you're in a classroom or you're in a lecture or in a seminar, um, talking with your lecturers and, and having classes on campus or 
in the case of the last couple of years online, um, but having that contact with your um, academics, so your teachers um, is what we call contact hours. So for some courses, they, they have a much higher contact hours per week. So those are more the practical subjects, so more like engineering, science, where you need those labs to be able to do all of your experiments. You need those um, physical environments to be able to, to do those subjects. And then also um, looking at maybe like art and design courses, they're a little bit less because you come to class and you present your work and you say, here's what I've done this week. And then you get some feedback and you work on it a little bit, but then all, a lot of the time is done outside of the classroom. So it just depends on which subject you're doing. So you could be doing anywhere from 12 hours a week on campus to 24 to 40, depending on what subject you're taking. And generally it kind of increases each year. So as you're doing the general subjects in year, in year one, and as you get more specialized and need more sort of hands-on time, you'll have more contact hours. Um, oh, awesome, I love this question. What kind of exchange courses do you offer? So I used to work in the exchange office and it is an incredible place um, to work and to be a part of. Um, so we have over 300 exchange partners globally. So everything from Ivy League business schools in the US to um, schools in Iceland, um, Antarctica and everywhere in between. So there's definitely options for you. Um, so we have some university degrees that include a year on exchange. For example, our Bachelor of International Studies. We have a Commerce International and we also have a Science International. So those are where you get a full year dedicated to doing that exchange. However, most other courses, I would say 98% of courses at UNSW, you can go on exchange for six months up to a year in any course. So you don't have to be doing that international stream. Um, so there's so many different options. You apply generally at the end of your first year or into your second year to go and exchange a year in advance. So it is a bit of a process um, and you do need to match subjects back um, to UNSW. So you're getting course credit. So by doing exchange, that means that you're not actually extending your degree at all. Mm -hmm. You're doing subjects at an overseas university instead of at UNSW. And to point out as well, you're paying UNSW fees for exchange. So you're not paying um, Ivy League school fees to go. Um, you are still paying your normal UNSW tuition um, and that covers you to go on exchange. So you are able to put all of your courses that you do on exchange on HEX, the same as you would any other course at UNSW. Um, okay, one for you. Oh, Is great. it more beneficial to perform averagely in an advanced course or perform highly in a standard course? Well, you can't guarantee you're going to perform uh, highly <laughs> in a standard course or maybe even average in a advanced course. I can give you an example. Um, you know, I do, it was actually my own son who was bottom of the class, English advanced, getting results of 71. He could guarantee that he was going to get results of that. He was in the bottom 25% of students. So we looked at his scaled mark for that. And I said to him, look, we can guarantee you're going to do that. The only way is up. Uh, then we looked at the standard English course and um, to get those same scaled marks, he would have had to be performing in the top 25%. And wow. there was no guarantee because with mm. those courses, the subject content is so different. So um, it's really personal choice. He yeah. decided to stick it out and he did perform better in his HSC results, like the exams, and it took him out of that standard level of achievement into mm -hmm. a higher a band of achievement. And now he's at university where you have a lot more choice and he's a math science mm -hmm. student. He avoids anything that has essay writing components, so he can't avoid it forever, obviously, because you do have to be able to communicate your ideas. But um, it's really personal choice. I would advise you if you're thinking about dropping down to a lower course, speak to your teachers because they know your academic ability yep. and uh, they will give you the best advice. But don't look at our scaling report and choose courses based on scaling. Speak to your teachers, put scaling out of your mind and do courses that you are going to enjoy. I know we keep saying it, but yeah. enjoy and they're the ones that you're going to get your best results in. 
Absolutely, 100% yeah. agree. Um, I might take this and then we might have to wrap up. We're slowly running out of time here. Well, fast running out of time, actually. Um, so how about gap years? So you can take a gap year. Um, of course, you can take two gap years if you like, if the course allows it. Um, so what you would do is you would accept your offer to the university of your choice and then you would defer that offer. So you would say, hi, thanks so much for my offer, but not right now. So you would just pause that offer and then elect how long it is until you would like to come back. And then you can go and travel the world, do your jobs, do whatever you like for that year, get some more life experience and come back and then be ready to study. So it's, it is definitely possible and a really great way if you're not ready to just keep going with the studies. You know, it's, it's a great way again to kind of avoid burnout if you're feeling like you've been pushing yourself so hard through the HSC. Um, so that about wraps us up. Um, so thanks so much, Wendy, for coming oh, along you're today. Most welcome. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone, for coming along and joining us today. Um, if you do have any more questions, um, the Future Students Inquiries team is here to answer all of your questions. But also, please, please, please come along to our um, experience days in July. Please come along to our open day. We'd love to have you. We'd love to see you on campus. Um, and so you can get to know UNSW.